Hello, this is Lance O'Connor, and I'm here with Brit Week with Phil Hansen. Hi, Phil. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Lance? Great, thanks. Uh, congratulations on Monza and uh, and also Le Mans. Obviously, incredible uh, achievement in such a short period of time. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's been a crazy year so far, really. If you had to pick one of them, which one's your favorite one to drive? What, Le Mans? Oh, in terms of tracks, yeah. I mean, Le Mans. Um, Monza was my most recent success, obviously, in the European Championship. Um, but Le Mans is just special. To be honest, my favorite circuit is Spa, but we won there too. But, um, but yeah, Le Mans, just because of the event and the historic relevance, I think it's, it's the most special to me. Yeah, I even, I'm old and I even remember it as a kid. I mean, it's incredible. Um, you know, what, what about training for Le Mans? And, you know, what do you do? Do you do something different for that specific race just because of the endurance of it? Um, I wouldn't say anything different, but I would say that we structure our entire year's training protocols around Le Mans being the peak event. Um, so although we have an off season and, and, and a normal season, which is normally the calendar year, um, last year was slightly different with the championship rolling over two calendar years, obviously starting in September and finishing in what's well, meant to finish in June this year. But COVID set that back to September. Um, but yeah, my year looks like it has an off season, but in reality, we're, the off season is the month after Le Mans and then we start preparing for Le Mans um, straight after. Um, a lot of people take different emphasis on what, how physical fit you have to be um, for Le Mans. Some people don't train much, some people train like me. Um, and I think I'm, what I do separates me from the others um, and probably had a large amount of, of why we won this year. That's great. Now, with um, COVID, you talked about protocols and you talk like any athlete, as you even for the Olympics, they've got messed up with uh, their training programs. And obviously everything is back engineered. How has COVID affected your 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 preparation for Le Mans? Let's just, just even go in into that with protocols, your team and whatever else. What 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 changes were made to make sure that you successfully got there? Well, in all honesty, um, the team moved manufacturer at the end of last year from Ligier to Orica, which are one of the four um, LMP2 manufacturers. And because we moved at the end of last year, still in the racing season, we now had that off season that I talk about, which is at the end of the calendar year, if you're excluding Le Mans, um, to really go through and get the mechanics familiar with some of the the different programs and and elements to a different manufacturer and manufacturer change. Um, so although COVID upset the schedule quite quite a lot, it actually gave an opportunity to the, for the engineers to take mechanics through things that we'd normally do before the season starts and um, and go through things in detail, um, which you'd normally do in a preparation, but we hadn't had the chance to because of the, the lateness of the, um, the manufacture change um, at the end of last year. Um, and then for me, obviously, my training was completely upset. Um, where I'd normally go into the gym, I couldn't go because we were in lockdown for sort of three months. Um, but luckily, I was um, just made built a new house, so we had a we'd put a gym in there, and I was building a relationship with a few sports companies. So I was able to kit out with everything that I would need need if I was to be there for for years to come. Um, and that was maybe a few weeks before we announced the quarantine lockdown. So it was a stroke of luck that I really was maximally prepared for for the quarantine. And, and my PT could just send me programs and and I had no other time but to train because what else could you do in those times, really? I learned how to juggle, but that wasn't very useful. <laughs> it actually comes to exactly what I, I was going to ask you. COVID, it's here. And more importantly, instead of looking at negatives all the time, you've just given us a few positives of what yeah, COVID is. Doing, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people are seeing a lot of great change in the world right now and in many different aspects because of COVID, because we've actually had to change. Now, for you and your team, have there been any noticeable changes that you would say have benefited you as a driver um, with your team as well? Um, not really. I think... To be honest, all the all the government implementations of these different restrictions, making sure you get tested before you go away, travel becomes a bit more tricky, logistics become a bit more of a nightmare, and the mask and the, the general stress that it has on every personnel um, and every person in the team um, with worrying, are you going to test positive asymptomatically, or you know, have you picked something up, who you've been in contact with recently, it just adds stress to the whole thing, um, which isn't great in, in a sporting environment because there's already some 
naturally from from the sector that we're in um so i think even for me like i was i started not seeing friends or or not seeing people that i knew within even if it was outdoors and socially distanced i start stopped seeing them for about five six days before i was going to get a covid test just to make sure maybe if i had something could i get rid of it and I just don't want it to come up on a test um, because I felt fine. Obviously, there's no symptoms, but you just never know. Um, and before these big races, the Le Mans, um, with that being part of the World Championship this year, it was double points. So we knew that it was going to be the championship decider for, for a lot of the categories and ours, especially LMP2. So um, I needed to make sure that I was training, but at the same time being quite strict with my social distancing and making sure that I was staying away from groups that... I might catch COVID from, um, which was stressful for me because I remember sort of waking up every day, has my test come through yet? Has my test come through yet? And just worried about that. And as soon as it came through, I was like, okay, I'm clean. Like, you know, now now I can go and no one's going to stop me. And even every day you go into the track, you get your temperature checked. They ask you how you're feeling. And we had our temperatures checked before we went to the track because if I was in a car with six people and one of them had a temperature, the whole car would be taken out and tested for COVID. And the delay of which it takes to test people and take them out of the track and find out who you've been in contact with, you could quite easily miss qualifying or the race. So there was all that stress. And then when we, once we got into the track on Saturday morning at Le Mans, it was like, okay, just focus on the task. But that's just added stress, which you don't normally want as a, as a professional sportsman. Well, whenever you talk about that stress, let's talk about the other one. This time, Le Mans was behind closed doors. And uh, this time, you didn't have all the the people there was no, none none of the the sort of glitz and glamour of of Le Mans was there so did that actually alleviate a lot of the anxiety and pressure just on the fact that it, you're going to an empty track that has literally got nobody there did it help or or or, or what what was it like to be on the track at that time the the pressure element in terms of being in the car at the time doesn't change because you've still got the work to do. And when you're in the car, you don't really pay attention to the fact that there's, you know, 200, 300,000 fans around the track. You pay attention to the fact that uh, my boss, my engineer, my everyone is seeing my lap times right now. And I'm being caught by half a second a lap or I'm, you know, not getting quick down to the lap times or whatever. So the pressure is still on in the car. You, you never really think about the fans and everything. But what did change is the build up to the one. Normally it's this big event like any big sporting event there's this hype around it you have all these media opportunities for the teams and drivers to you know come in close contact with the fans and and I, I think I've said in a few different the biggest difference for me personally was that on the Friday before Le Mans what Le Mans normally on Saturday and Sunday um, there's this driver's parade through the Le Mans town um, which yeah which is just it's this manic parade, you know, from from kilometers and kilometers and kilometers of, of just literally all the fans that you'd normally have around the track all come into this town, and it's like it's hours long. And I remember, I normally I remember my first one. You get there and and you're thinking it's three hours before we're going, and it takes five hours before you actually start because it's always delayed because there's so many people. And on my first Le Mans, I remember coming back on that Friday evening and thinking I'm absolutely shattered. Like that felt harder than what I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm just because I was just all the energy and atmosphere from all the fans everyone's screaming like my voice was nearly gone everything um so although there was this added pressure from covid and watching out and making sure you were careful and just the stress that was on the team you know making sure that every single person was accountable for their risk um then there was also pr pressure taken off us with the fact that there was that, that whole friday parade although it's great and i really enjoy it it made it a lot easier this year now team wise did you have to adapt or change um, the team size, the, the way that the team worked. I mean, was there, what what did you do with your team um, going to Le Mans and what changes did you have to make for COVID? Well, United Autosports, which is a team I raced for, is is one of the biggest teams in endurance racing at the time, currently. Um, and they have many different championships they've taken. They've done the Asian Le Mans series. They currently do the European Championship and the World Championship. Um, and the issue with, with these events is they not only do those championships with my car, the LMP2 car, but there's a sister LMP2 car. There's two LMP3 cars in the European Championship along with us, and they even have two or three support, or four, I think, even the support race at Le Mans, an LMP3, um, you know, Gentleman Drivers Championship. Um, and when you have all these 80 personnel that turn to the track, normally it's a case of, okay, hospitality is open for everyone to eat and socialize and hospitality is sort of closed outside of normal 
allowed for sponsors and VIPs and things like that and media and activities like that. Um, but this time we were having to bubble and change up the different groups to make sure that we weren't coming into contact with anyone else in case, like I said, someone comes down, they take out the whole bubble. So it was a lot more secluded. You were around your, your teammates even more, um, your engineer, and, um, and you had basically time slots for everything just to make sure that, God forbid, if anything happened, or anything had happened, um, you, you wouldn't be jeopardizing anyone else if you were the one that came down for it. So you wouldn't be ruining both cars' opportunity to race at Le Mans, just your own, or if it was the other car that they wouldn't be ruining ours, or even for the support championships or anyone. Right. Uh, tell us about the race. I mean... A lot of people talk about the interview, but but what was it actually like getting around that track? I mean, just the race itself, how difficult is it? I mean, it's an old, old, it's a, it's the tradition, tradition, tradition. Tell us about what it was like and, and how enduring it was and, and compared to other races that you do. And how did you feel? How did you feel about doing that race? Well, um, this is my fourth Le Mans now at 21 years old, I would have been 20 if it was held in June, so I'll be I'm 21, but I started my first Le Mans when I was 17. Um, and every year I underestimate it the week before, and then I get to the early hours in the morning, I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, this is really hard. Um, and then I train a lot harder than than most of the drivers, to be honest. I'm, I think of myself as, as the fittest on the grid, and I, I try and keep pushing that bar up every year. Um, and the positive effect it then has on my teammates, you know, I can ask them, what are you up to? And they're like, oh, family stuff, did this, did this. And then halfway through the year when I'm training hard, all of a sudden it's, what did you get up to? And they're like, oh, I've been training loads. Just because of the positive example you can set and this, this uh, you know, unconscious awareness that someone's training hard, I should train hard. Um, and you, you get through the race in the first few hours, they go by quite quite quick. And then you're looking, you're starting to get to sleep after your second stint and you're trying to sleep. And this year was so different for me because I used to always give people a lot of grief when they told me they couldn't sleep. They, they never slept at Le Mans. They used to do Le Mans, the 24 hour race, the big grueling race with no sleep or look how hard I am, look how much of an I am. And I was like, well, that's impossible. I always sleep. And this year I, I could, I could not sleep. And I'm thinking I've, I've, I feel like such a hypocrite because I've been criticizing so many people that they don't sleep. Um, but it, it was the adrenaline. It was the fact that we were up at the front with an opportunity to win. And all I wanted to do was get back in the car. Um, because I felt like at least then I was under my control. And so did both my teammates. My teammates thought the exact same. They wanted just to always get back in the car and that's why they weren't sleeping very well. Um, and you got to the morning and I remember it was just, I was sleeping 20 minutes, if that, and the 20 minutes of sleep was just complete conscious sleep. I was basically awake. We were so close to the track this year where the motorhomes had moved closer to the paddock, which was good because you could travel quicker where normally the whole fans would be in a lot of these sort of pop-up markets and other things for the fans to enjoy would normally be um they moved us closer but that meant we were right outside turn one so you just had the crackle of the exhaust and the noise of the engines the entire night um so i didn't sleep at all and yeah you get to the morning and you, you you're feeling tired you, you know it's your body is drained but that's fine it's just your your mental fatigue that starts to set in and you can feel it um you don't let it affect you and you have the little boost of adrenaline because you know you've got the hunt to win and you look at the gaps behind you who's who's you who playing for who do you have to try and overtake who do you have to try and manage um who's catching who's quick who's in the car at the same time and once you get the first lap in the race the adrenaline takes over but what's crucial is because 24 hours at Le Mans is now a sprint race with the cars being so reliable you, that one lap you don't have to adjust you have to get in that car and that first corner needs to hit the apex you need to be on the breaking point you can't you can't leave two tenths there because if you leave two tenths on one lap at every corner that's two seconds um and at Le Mans that, that this year was it was tight so it was um it was tough it was tough so just even on said you know your success 21 18 wins 29 podiums four pole positions I mean, it's mind blowing. I even I, I read that you started at, uh, late at 14, 15 years of age was your first race. Silverstone I means absolutely it's it's basically six years and you've made that amount of winning. I mean, it's 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 an incredible feat. What is United and what are you intending to do? I mean, what what what's the plans? What's the crystal ball? There's a bigger one. Yeah, well. Um, we won LMP2 in the World Championship, we won the European Championship, and we won Le Mans all in one year. And I think we were the actual, the only, the only people to ever do that in one year. 
Um, and it's been a crazy year, obviously, with everything we just talked about. But for me, I want to have a, a big manufacturer contract for being able to try and tackle Le Mans and the World Championship outright in the future. So there's um, new regulations coming into the sport and they're trying to attract more manufacturers back to the good old days when they had, you know, the Porsche, Toyota, Audi, all these great manufacturers. Even if you look back at that recent movie, Le Mans 66, when you had, you know, your, your Fords and your, your Ferraris and your Porsches. Um, and, and I love the sport. I'm a passionate guy for racing. So I want the sport to come back to what it was. I want the level of competition to be incredibly high um, because it makes it even more rewarding if you can be up there at the front and contesting for the win and the championship win or potentially even a Le Mans outright win. And I didn't think Le Mans, I mean, I, I, it was always an ambition of mine. And then as soon as you get it, it, it's an unbelievable achievement, yeah, for a few days or weeks, but then you're straight back onto the next race. And that's what's 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 interesting about racing is you lose so much more than you win. Unless your name's Lewis Hamilton and you you know you can have a dominant run for the last seven years, you just losing is is the familiar familiarity of, of the sport, um, and winning's the rarity. So it's that hunger that keeps everyone competitive, and that's something I want to be in a good position to be able to compete for the overall win at Le Mans in the next couple of years and hopefully when these new regulations come in hopefully I'm, uh, I'm at the top of the list of, of drivers that manufacturers are looking for um, if they're hungry to win. So what is the series doing to attract uh, the manufacturers to come in or the sponsors to come in to make the, the to make it grow? Well um, like anything once there's something good people try and change it and bring in their ideas and sometimes it doesn't go the right direction um, and I think the, the biggest biggest reason for it all falling apart in the recent years has been their financial burden at Le Mans and the World Championship became quite expensive for a lot of these manufacturers with uh, developing bread types and the organisers and the FIA um, influencing it and making sure that they were becoming more and more of like a hybrid engine taking over and much more efficient, um, which is good for productivity and research and development and helps you know, the whole motorsport and the whole motor industry, but it just meant the costs were going up every year. Um, so this year, or the, the regulations are out, but obviously it'll take a few years for manufacturers to develop and come in. But um, essentially the whole program is around having consistent regulations amongst different cars. So there's not a, a hybrid car versus a, pres a privateer car, which hasn't got a hybrid engine, a hybrid right. engine that isn't gonna cost fortunes to develop every year a spec one that's going to be consistent over the entire board of different cars um, and that the, it has a, a very low cost cap. So they're not going to limit the amount of money you can spend, but they're going to manage it to be very low. So essentially, it's going to be very similar to what we have, what you have in America, which is a, called DPI, Daytona Prototype International is what it stands for. And that's uh, an LMP2 chassis with spec, or not, not spec, with um, a manufacturer's engine, manufacturer developed suspension and aero. And you're having a similar aspect for this new regulation called LMDH, and it stands for Le Mans Daytona Hybrid, um, which is going to be great because it's going to you're going to be able to race Daytona 24 hours. You're going to be able to race the big events in America and potentially the World Championship and uh, and Le Mans. So hopefully it's this coalition between the Amer American manufacturers, which there are a few now with Mazda, Cadillac, um, Acura, and some of the big European manufacturers and global manufacturers of Toyota and and rumors of many other manufacturers coming in as well. So and, what about uh, and if, if, if each car, if each team has two cars, there's three drivers per, per car, then hopefully there'll be, there won't be enough drivers. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. So you just bring to one of my last questions, electric, hybrid. What's your view on how the engines are changing? I mean, you're, you're 21 years old. And the whole world is now changing and going into the hybrid electric world. How's that affecting racing? It is affecting. Well, racing sort of is is leading this change because we have Formula E, which is and, and manufacturers that are leading the change of this hybrid and electric era, um, getting away from you know burning fossil fuels and, and all sorts of um, naturally produced fuels to more sustainable sources, um, which is good for for as a, a global community to be able to make everything a bit more sustainable, which I'm, I'm completely on board with. 
Um, what I don't like is change. Like no one likes change. Um, but what I've realized is, is change happens over such a long time that it never really feels like change. Um, in my eyes, I, I don't think electric is the future. I think hybrid will be the future. Um, I think fossil fuels will be like an asymptote. You'll get very low, but by the time we get really low, we'll be so efficient at refining it, we'll be so efficient at using it that we'll never really run out. Um, it's just getting to that efficiency level that we need to be able to do and use to be able to, to have it prolong and, and last for a long time, um, which we're not having at the moment, um, which is a bit of a shame. Um, and for me, I think hybrid will be the future purely because I don't really trust how we're going to be able to get rid of all these um, lithium batteries and these incredibly environmental disasters, really, with, all, with how we're going to be able to pump up all these uh, electric motors and and everything. I think hybrid sounds like the, the plausible one for me, which is like a very efficient engine with the benefits of being able to recharge and charge an electric bat battery and, and the longevity of that system being a lot longer than just purely electric. And I think that will be the change that we move to that. And then whether we move from there to fully electric in, in the coming years, I don't know. But also I think as we're pushing a change now, but I, I'm curious to see what the consequences of this change will be um, in terms of what, what do we do in sort of seven years time when we have all these lithium batteries, where are we going to put them all? We're not going to put them in the bottom of the ocean. We're not going to dig them into a hole. Um, so I think a hybrid will be the future. And, and that's where racing is going as well. So hopefully it'll it'll all work out. Great. And then uh, my last question, my last question, you personally, uh, ambitions, what, what, what ambition have you got? Um, apart from the, what you've already said about Le Mans, but further than that, I mean, is there any other platform of racing, any other place that you'd like to be going? Is F1 something that would be of interest to you down the line? Uh, following in Lewis Hamilton, 92 wins today, by the way, but the trajectory you've got right now, you're going to beat him in around five years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think that that ship has sailed just purely because of my decision making early on in my career. Um, I didn't really understand motorsport in, in cars as much as I probably should have. We didn't have very good guidance in the early days, but it, it's worked out well because I found myself in this position now where I've had a lot of success in endurance racing and, it, and it's, it's a home for me and I really enjoy the people and working with these teams. And, and I think if it comes back in the next couple of years, year and a half, which I think it will, and I'm really excited to see it come back, I'm, I'm happy for that journey to continue. Um, but I, I, I don't want to say that I want to stay in endurance racing forever because I'm not sure what will change and whether, you know, touring cars or something like that might excite me in the future. I mean, right now, my my short future, my, my broader horizon um, is this overall win at Le Mans, just because it's it's something that I can I can see myself being able to work hard and potentially achieve if I get myself in the right position in, in the coming few years. Um, but some people never win Le Mans outright. A lot of people don't. Um, so if that's an ambition that I can chase my whole life, then uh, I'd be happy with that. But for right now, that's that's going to be the ambition. And maybe in, in five years' time, 10 years' time, if I've reached that, um, we might see what's next. But as for now, I think that's that's my ambition. So with Brexit happening at the moment, has that got influencing you and the way that you're able to move around? And will that change where you're uh, going to be? Or is are you always on the move? Is the team always on the move? Or how is it affecting you at the moment? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of things going on in the world right now. But um, yeah, it doesn't really affect sports as much. I think it's a little bubble where we can kind of put our heads in the sand and not really try and pay attention to a lot of it at, at times, which is which is great for, for people because, you know, you're, you're not as, I mean, teams are incredibly affected with how things change. Um, but as a driver, my job is just to drive as fast as I can, as many laps as I can. Um, so I just wake up, eat breakfast, train hard, work on, work on what I'm here to work on. And then a few days later, I get my, my flight ticket sent to me on my email, print it off, and I head to the airport. And I think that's kind of my lifestyle at the moment, which is um, training, working hard, and then uh, and then going to the racetrack. Um, and I think it, it'll all work out. I think, like I said, change, no one likes change, but um, but it happens so gradually that we'll all get used to it. And, uh, and I'm lucky also, I have a German passport, so I'm not too affected by the whole Brexit thing. I think one of the take-homes I'm taking from this interview. You're very smart for the age that you are, but one of the lines you came up with, which I think is fantastic, nobody likes change, but we're always changing. Yeah. I think that's really appropriate right now because we're all being faced with that. 
Um, so in saying that, I just want to say thanks very much indeed for your time and good luck in the future. Um, and it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lance. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.